of the things to be, the pains that are withheld for me, I realize and I can see. Suicide is painless, it brings on many changes, and I can take or leave it if I please. The game of life is hard to play, I'm gonna lose it anyway, the losing card I'll someday lay. So this is all I have to say. Suicide is painless. Suicide. It brings on many changes. changes. And I can take or leave it if I please. The sword of time will pierce our skin. It doesn't hurt. Brad, you're muted. Me, Jarvis. All right, here we are. I'm Brad Grossman. I'm the founder of Zeitguide. And uh, I'm really happy that you're all here. And this is actually the, I think it might be the 17th uh, is it culture class that I've done since COVID, which was March 18th. I hope my math is correct. And uh, here we are. And we're going to talk about medicine and healthcare. And I am so grateful that we have two people who have been experiencing this entire situation on the front line. We have uh, Dr. Roxana Miran uh, from uh, Mount Sinai. Uh, she is the lead academic, you'll be able to explain, and in cl clinical cardiology. Uh, interventionist cardiology. Have I said that right, Roxana? You could say hi. We'll see you in a bit. Hi, everyone. Interventional cardiology. There you go. So <laughs> happy that you're here. And we also have Nicole Friday. Nicole, say hi. Hi, everyone. Nicole is actually in, where are you right now? Savannah, Georgia. That's what I thought. And you've been on the front lines as somebody who's in hospital administration. So, so grateful you're here as well. So we're gonna hear some two, um, from two very important people that we're really grateful for, not only to be here, but all the work you've been doing and going to continue to do because there was a report today about how uh, we really are as much in a dire situation here in the United States as we were in March. 
That's something that was just released and I just read it in the New York Times. But just going sideways for a second, that song that I played was the theme song from MASH. Uh, many of you on this call might be too young to know what MASH is, but it started as a movie directed by Robert Altman, uh, amazing director. Uh, he's no longer with us. And he actually wrote that theme song for the movie in the 70s. And he, actually his son wrote it, who was 14 years old. So think about how creative your kids in self-quarantine could be. They could write great songs. And he didn't know what suicide was, but Robert Altman is like, just use these words and make up the song. And he did that. So I played that because obviously it has the medical theme because it's about uh, medical, uh, doctors on the front lines in the Vietnam War. So you know how I love to go back into history to contextualize what's going on right now. That being said, uh, we and then it turned into a TV show in the 80s. And that song actually was like on the UK billboard top 100, even higher than that. So there's a little cultural context. And that is the purpose of culture class, right? I'm here to help you understand where we are, to keep you culturally relevant, to keep you inspired to reinvent the future. And hopefully, you won't be turning on your nightly news and the breaking news, so it's so depressing. All you have to do is come here and hopefully we'll all learn what we all need to know in a different point of view. And meeting experts like Roxana and Nicole that I'm finding have a great voice who should be heard all over the world. And hopefully someday cultural class will be that way. And so everybody knows if you've heard this, I'm gonna be two seconds, the way that I granulate the world and bucketize it. I always look at global societal issues, tech trends, consumer trends, workplace trends, and I'm not just pushing out information to you. I am hoping that you understand what you're learning and ask you how is it relevant to you and how will it impact your lives. So uh, Jarvis, thank you for being here. You're our associate producer. Uh, you've been awesome. And uh, I asked you to put everybody on mute and you put me on mute too. So you did your job amazingly. And last question, Jarvis, uh, is that light distracting? I think so, right? No? You're on mute. You're really okay. great. I think <laughs> it's a little distracting. You want to turn it off? Sure. Oh. All right, is that better? All right, now let's get going. Because before we hear from Nicole and Dr. Moran, we are going to do my little zeit guiding. And today's theme, as I like to do a theme every single week, is what I'm calling. So look, week one, look at all the themes, just like the scroll, like the movie credits that we just saw at the end of MASH. And today, I will be talking about a concept that I've been thinking about and developing called the new domesticity. And uh, actually, uh, I'm really excited because I uh, thought about one of the things that I studied at Brown. Believe it or not, I graduated with a degree in 1997 uh, on cultural studies. And I'm blessed that I was supposed to uh, I'm blessed that I found a career that I got to use my degree for. Um, I was supposed to be a doctor and uh, I studied pre-med and I actually did really, really well. And I was going to go to medical school, but then actually I had an internship one summer at Mount Sinai and uh, I throw up on a patient. So thank God I'm not a doctor. And we have <laughs> Roxana here who is uh, and Nicole who experiences hospitals too. It just wasn't for me. So this theme, like I said, is what I'm calling the new domesticity. And I read this book at Brown called Desire and Domestic Fiction. And what I learned was that the domestic novel that was written in the 18th and the 19th century, right? You might think of like Dangerous Liaisons, you might think of, which is written in French, and I don't know French, so I'm not gonna, uh, uh, you know, ruin the beautiful way of saying it, or a Jane Austen novel, or if you watch Downton Abbey, Downton Abbey is actually takes place, you know, in the turn of the 20th century, but that was a historical uh, representation of English culture for uh, a couple centuries. And that actually represented the new domesticity in a way. So women were reading what they called the, dom the domestic novel. 
And as a cultural artifact, it shaped the way that women thought that they should conduct themselves by being the woman in the house, the person taking care of the kids, the person who basically in the family is taking care of the house, the private sphere, where the husband actually went into the city, into London, let's say, or Paris, uh, and worked. So there was a division between private life and public life. And they created the heart of the household, and this eventually evolved what defined what I was, what they call the nuclear family, the middle class family. And obviously that has, for those of you who have even have experienced this, continued until uh, the 50s and then in the 60s during uh, the Vietnam War era, civil rights, women's liberation, gay rights, there was this epistemological shift in terms of how women started to reconceptualize um, their role in the family. And as we are today, we know that we still have a lot of work to do. There's definitely been progress since the time of the domestic novel, right? But we have a lot of work to do. So that's just a little historical perspective of like the 18th and 19th century leading up to the 20th century to where we are now. And now I'm calling, now that we're all quarantined in our houses, the new domesticity. And whereas the old domesticity, was, there was a, pro, uh, a division between the private sphere and the public sphere, now that we're all home, we're seeing a confluence of the private sphere and the public sphere. And it's not only COVID that has done that, it is basically social media. Everybody taking Instagrams of like their sourdough bread. So look how we are evolving to what I'm calling the new domesticity. Uh, I'm just going to go through a couple links that kind of help me contextualize this. And I remember, thank you very much to those who contributed uh, at the end of the week. We email all of you all the links uh, that have shaped my, uh, my lesson. I guess I'm a lesson planner. I'm a professor, right? Pop professor, I guess I finally figured out what my life's work is. Uh, anyway, so... Number one, this is going to continue the new domesticity. As I said, in America so far, we'll see what happens to the rest of the world, although we are seeing in Japan and other places, Hong Kong, there have been spikes. And uh, work from home is basically here to stay. And if we go back to what I said about gender, right, in the, uh, you know, a few centuries ago to now, uh, we definitely have made progress but this stay-at-home culture has changed women's lives, right? And we have been making this, this uh, uh, progress to having advancement of women in you know, work. Again, we have a lot of work to do, but could this experience undo in many families all the progress that women have been fighting for? And this article from the BBC talks about this woman, right, where she was actually hoping uh, that this uh, pandemic would enable her to split all the house activities between her and her husband, but her husband happened to have a job that had more uh, Zoom meetings, right? And so Boston Consulting Group basically surveyed more than 3,000 people and found that working women currently spend an average of 15 hours a week more on unpaid domestic labor than men. So again, this is the new domesticity and uh, you know, we're, hopefully we're not going to regress in terms of all the progress we've made in terms of dividing uh, roles for women and men in the household. Now, there is this, there is a glimmer of hope here, right? And they actually did a survey uh, towards the end of the article. Uh, I'll go all the way. To, it's a long article, but that's my job is to read it. So you don't have to. Uh, and uh, where is that part? Yeah. Can we get back on track? And more than 40% of fathers said they were cooking more while around 30% reported that they had increased the amount of time they spent on laundry and cleaning. So even though women kind of took control in the beginning of domesticity, 
men are actually stepping up to the plate. So there is a glimmer of hope, but I think we really should encourage that. Now, the horrible thing about this new domesticity is there has been a rise in uh, domestic violence that a lot of people have been talking about and a, and a rise in mental health. So I'm staying on gender right here. And one of the things I wanted to show this clip that actually shaped and made me realize that this would be an amazing subject to talk about is because Jane Pauley, the host of CBS Sunday Morning, was talking about the, the revival of this book, which I bought, uh, which is like the Bible of how to the art and science of keeping a house. And I just watched this clip and I want you to just see the signs and symbol, symbols that I thought were a little controversial. Room, given a proper going over when they finish their breakfast. Not since season three of Downton Abbey has so much spring cleaning been seen in my house. Upstairs, vacuuming the furniture. Downstairs, you wang it. Cleaning the vacuum filters. You wang it until it stops uh, loosening dirt. Fighting grime with a fine tooth brush. And I wasn't alone. In just a few minutes, you can actually see the progress that you've made. Spring cleaning has swept the country this spring. Cleaning and organization adds some structure to a very unstructured time. In Olive Branch, Mississippi, Heather Chambliss and her family used their stay at home time to tackle a to do list. This is a project that we meant to do last summer, and we're finally getting to it. And in New York City... I found my son in the kitchen on his knees, rearranging the canned goods. Believe me, you don't see this with 20-somethings all the time. <laughs> this was unprecedented. Cheryl Mendelson wrote the book on homekeeping. All right, so uh, it's a, I can't go through it all in this culture class because then we'll never hear from our zeitgeist. But one of the problems I had was like, I saw those videos and how many men, even though she talked about her son, uh, were shown in that, those images. They were all women except that one dad in the picture. So I just wanted to bring that out. And then the other thing about gender relationships in the in the uh, one thing that we have probably reversed in the uh, maybe whether it's pejorative, but definitely in dominant culture, we have seen men wanting to have sex with their wives. And usually in media and entertainment, we've seen like the wives being like, stay away, stay away. But this is a commercial that just came out literally today um, by Viagra.
Well, there's definitely evolved from like in uncertain times uh, commercials we've been seeing uh, from brands. And I feel like now these brands and advertisers are now going into the human level because we are really feeling on almost the fifth month of this COVID stay at home crisis here in the States. Uh, affecting our psyches, mental health, and everything. Um, I'm just going to flip through these pretty quickly. Uh, so back to the new domesticity theme. Uh, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal about how people are moving to the suburbs in Connecticut, and although prices have been dropping forever, uh, the those, like my brother, by the way, uh, is going to uh, score uh, in terms of people having an exodus out of the city. Uh, basically, there was a piece today in the Wall Street Journal about how what's bolstering up the economy are homes and also cars. So if we harken back to the 18th and 19th century, the cars are like the new horse and buggies that are going to have them escape the house and take them to the cities. We know that in LA and San Diego, Gavin Newsom said that the schools aren't going to reopen. So uh, what's happening right now is that uh, many of the parents are like, oh my God, what are we going to do? And those who do work uh, are really, you know, especially those who have to go to a location, aren't going to be able, not everybody's going to be able to afford this. And, but also this is another reason, this is another parallel to the new domesticity where they all had tutors and nannies. On uh, actually just a little bit of context, Axios and Ipsos did a poll, which says that 71% of parents polled says it'd be risky to send children back to school in the fall. Nine in 10 black Americans and even a slim majority of Republicans said that they are scared to send their kids back. And in Los Angeles, there are more parents who are considering homeschooling. And uh, I find this actually pretty fascinating because not everybody could afford that. I have friends in Los Angeles that I spoke to who basically said they're going to pull together 10 parents. They're going to have their kids socially distanced with masks. They're going to hire a teacher and give them all 10 grand. And obviously that's not going to be feasible for all the students um, because many are in the public school system there and are living, even though LA, there are a lot of rich people. There are also a lot of uh, people who are less fortunate. And the other thing about the new domesticity is that Gen Zs are creating their own homes. Since colleges aren't really, I mean, Harvard said they're gonna have 40% allowed back onto campus. That doesn't mean that they will have student housing. Many kids that I've been hearing are renting houses or apartments together on college campuses because they don't wanna live with their parents. They don't wanna be part of this new home domesticity. So my, my opinion is, is that these kids are gonna be the most mature generation ever because they're all gonna take care of themselves. In fact, uh, Axios, I saw had a poll that uh, you know, a lot of kids said, students, that they're not going to party, they're gonna be really serious about taking care of themselves. And if somebody in their house gets COVID, what's gonna happen is that they're gonna quarantine in their apartments or their room for two weeks, and then somebody will cook their meals and give it to them. So this is kind of like the Gen Z new domesticity. And one of the things that I also wanted to say is that there was a piece in the New York Times about TikTok, and I don't want to go through all the drama that's happening in TikTok and China and all that kind of stuff. I don't have it. If you want to learn more about it, I do this customized for organizations and like-minded groups, and I have a premium where I spend an hour doing all this zeitgeiting. guiding. But these TikTok groups are actually calling themselves Hype House and Sway House, and they're in the merging. They're called the Swipe House. I actually know everything about TikTok because I hung out with my kids, my friends' uh, kids over the weekend, socially distancing in a pool. So you even got houses in, in the TikTok generation. And then we're going to talk about medicine, which is the main theme today. And telemedicine obviously is at an all time high. I had Simon Lorenz on like a month ago to teach us about his startup that is obviously through the roof. And telemedicine seems to have been the new domestic version of the doctor who has gone to the household to take care of those who are sick and ill. And one of the other things that's happening in medicine is that there's an uh, all-time high of cosmetic surgery, plastic surgery, because these patients could actually stay home and uh, you know recover from plastic surgery. The last thing I'm going to say 
is that I wanted to ask everybody if they know and somebody who is, uh, you know, if, if, if who wants to, if anybody knows the answer to this, I was just reading a chat and got distracted. That's what I hate about Zoom. Is that in the 18th and 19th century, we didn't have COVID. We had another disease. And in the, in the 18th century, I think it was one out of three people died of it. And then in the 19th century, one out of seven people died of tuberculosis, which was also called consumption. So there we have it. I compared the 18th and 19th century, which was the birth of domesticity, and to try to kind of sit back and see how the new domesticity is being shaped by the experiences that we're living in today. So uh, thanks for listening. That's my, like, uh, my uh, cultural sermon, let's say. So here we are, my favorite part. We're gonna do our hearts and minds segment because as you know, uh, this isn't just a normal interview. I wanna be like the Barbara Walters of culture and really uh, get into the hearts and minds and souls of all these amazing people who are um, donating their time to really teach all of us in this community. So uh, first we're gonna hear from Nicole Friday. Uh, who is in hospital administration. I'm gonna unshare the screen and... Uh, have we seen the slides for this whole thing? Jarvis? For your taps? Yeah. Um, we're looking at the most lovely and surprising ad you'll see today is for Viagra. So you've seen all of them, right? Everything before that, yes. All right, good, because it says my screen sharing is paused. Oh, because somebody else can. Okay, cool. You would think that after 18 of these, I would know how to use Zoom. But just so you know, people have encouraged me to do the, the seminar kind of thing. Uh, but, you know, I'm excited to show how many people are on this call, A, and I hope you all kind of chat each other and start meeting each other. And those of you who are single, this is really the only time we could actually meet people. So uh, take advantage of it. Uh, so, okay. The screen is not shared anymore. And I'd love to introduce Nicole Friday. And thank you for being here, Nicole. Um, you're in hospital administration. The yes. hospitals, yes. <laughs> and you have all the hospitals from the beginning have been and now again have been in the media for not having enough medical supplies, not having enough beds. Uh, you, I want you to please tell us all about what you've experienced in the hospital. And so first, let's just say like, so Nicole, what do you actually do for hospitals? What is ho uh, hospital administration? I'd love to know. That's an excellent place to start. Um, and I'm going to keep my segment very brief. I've learned very early in my career, when you have a world-renowned cardiologist that's going to follow you, you're going to keep your segment brief as a healthcare administrator. So healthcare Yeah, administrator, I love it. Yes, it's, we work in partnership with physicians. That's first and foremost. But what we're tasked with doing is really keeping the business of healthcare running, right? So we're focused on our people, because if you think about it, a hospital without people is just a, a building with a bunch of beds, right? So we're focused on our nursing staffing, we're focused on making sure we have the right number of pharmacists, we're making sure that our, when our physician comes in to treat a patient that they have essentially everything that they need, right? So people is key. Um, then we're focused on patient satisfaction. We want to make sure that everyone has a great experience when they come into our doors. And that's whether or not we're facing COVID or if it's a pre-COVID or post-COVID world, which we will hopefully we'll get to at some point. Quality is key. We're, we're always looking at quality in our outcomes because we have to ensure that when patients are coming to us, either in the hospital setting or in the outpatient setting, that they're receiving quality care. That's tandem out to who we are as an organization and what we do is we have to make sure that when you're coming to us for care that you're actually getting better. So we're tracking quality measures, we're reporting out on our quality measures, and we're continuously trying to improve on our quality. Growth is another thing. We have to ensure that we're growing in various areas so that if we have a great interventional cardiologist program that we're marketing and we're communicating what's going on so that people are coming. And for um, Mount Sinai, you have people who are coming from all across the world for the level of expertise that they have there. I've worked in an organization in Memphis, Tennessee, which was 
U.S. News and World Report ranked in eight different specialties, and we could draw people from across the world for some of our highest level specialties, right? And you, you want to think Memphis, Tennessee, everyone in Memphis knows that we have St. Jude, but St. Jude is a small hospital in terms of number of beds. So they do pediatric cancer surgery, and what we did was everything else. We did everything else, and we actually did their surgery, some of their surgeries at our hospital. Um, and then we're looking at finance, right? Because one key thing that you're going to learn in any industry is no margin, no mission, right? So we have to ensure that at the end of the day, we have enough money to put back into the organization to really ensure that we're able to provide quality care to every individual. And we're looking at our efficiency. We're making sure that we are um, being good stewards of the resources, right? So we have enough supplies. We're ordering supplies on a timely basis. The PPE, so that's what right? The PPE supplies that we've been yes. yeah. So that's, that's the job of a hospital administrator, really to focus on our key performance indicators and make sure that we're moving the needle on those items. So our world as hospital administrators, just with physicians, also got upturned with COVID, right? So with COVID, we're now facing a pandemic. Um, a pandemic isn't something that happens every day. So we <laughs> are Right. Now it is. You yeah. know, the last pandemic we faced of the scale was back in 1918. So this hopefully will be our one time in which we face a pandemic in our lifetimes, but it could happen more, you know, based on what's going on in the world. So really, we had to be agile, flexible, and, and able to respond to the information that was coming out from public health and from the CDC, which at the beginning of the pandemic was changing on a daily basis. So it's the role of a healthcare administrator to really work in tandem with our physician partners and aggregate all of this data that's coming in, all these recommendations from um, what face covering should be, what PPE should be at different levels of service, and then push that out. And then we had to respond very quickly and come up with recommendations on what does it look like when you're coming into a hospital setting. That has changed drastically. If anyone has been into a hospital, you know now that we, across the board, we have limited the number of visitors that can come into our healthcare system. Well, yeah, that's what, that's what I want to jump into. Okay, yeah. so where, where were you in March during yeah. the, yeah, where, where, where were you? At the beginning of March, I was still at Lebanon Children's Hospital, which is a phenomenal children's hospital in Memphis, Tennessee, and this outbreak was happening. And we didn't really know in the beginning. We knew that there were going to be hot spots, right? Because in a pandemic, it's really population driven. So New York, LA, most populous cities are going to be where you're going to see the effects of a pandemic first. In Memphis, Tennessee, we are not a huge city, but we knew that eventually it would be coming. So okay. there was what we would see in New York in, and we, would, we didn't know at the time how bad it would get throughout the rest of the world, right? Because yeah. The world is not new to pandemics. Pandemics have happened over time, and public health is very aware of how you actually treat, track, trace, and eliminate pandemics. Um, so we didn't know if this full scope of, or the full brunt of the pandemic was going to come to Memphis, Tennessee. But regardless, you still have to plan, because in America, people can travel. So even though, you know, Memphis, Tennessee isn't the most popping place, you know, we're not Nashville and we're not Atlanta, but we're still on the map and people can fly into Memphis and we're actually the number one um, hub for trans for shipments out of uh, Memphis, Tennessee, because that's where FedEx is located. So. Oh, really? That's interesting. OK, yeah. so what happened emotionally? Like, what were you feeling about this? I mean, your your role was to be a hotel administrator, right? So. You know, uh, you, people, you just like had this like black swan happen in a sense that you're yeah. like, OK, what are we going to do? And tell me about like, how is the collaboration happening? Mm -hmm. You said that you manage or make sure that the doctors have all their equipment. Uh, tell me a little bit more about the like what you were feeling during this, if you don't mind sharing. So we very quickly went into kind of a war room situation, right, where we had people from every aspect of the hospital. And then a lot of people, when you think of a hospital or you think of healthcare, you think of doctors and nurses. And, and that is very true. There are a lot of doctors, there are a lot of nurses, but we also have pharmacists. We already also have x-ray techs. We also have food service. We have EDS. And we had to come up with a comprehensive plan for everyone, right? And so we brought everyone together. We had daily phone calls. Um, we were meeting in our command center, going over what are we going to do? How are we going to respond? what is necessary in terms of resources and what it, what are we going to do to ensure that everyone stays safe and as a healthcare administrator you're concerned not only about the safety of the community but the safety of the people in your organization that's key so this conversation that's been happening around personal protective equipment 
is very, very big and, and near and dear to the hearts of every healthcare administrator because it, if we don't have people in the hospital, again, it's just a big building with a lot of beds. So we okay. had to ensure that our people are safe. All right. So you've been there since, are you still where you were in the beginning of COVID and are you experiencing this again? So actually I had accepted a new role. I had in the midst of, well, prior to COVID, I didn't know COVID was gonna happen. Unfortunately, I don't have a magic ball and couldn't see this coming. So I actually moved. Okay, it did. Uh, anyway, yeah. <laughs> I moved across country in the midst of a pandemic and started a new role with a very different healthcare organization. Um, and that was a crazy, crazy experience. First of all, I wouldn't recommend it to anyone. Um, if you know that a pandemic is coming, if you have insider knowledge, you probably should stay put. But I did not have this insider knowledge, and I, it was a great career opportunity, so I thought. So I was moving up in my levels of leadership um, and taking a, on more responsibility in an organization that is nationally known. And so I moved across country, and the pandemic, believe it or not, was there too. Pandemic means worldwide. So it, then it became, again, we're, we're fighting this pandemic day in, day out. Um, the good news is it was, we were a little bit further along, so it wasn't a thing of how do we get enough PPE. It was more, okay. Right, right. So wait, but you, so, okay. And then, and then what happened? So in the midst of that, you know, what I would say about COVID is COVID is, it is novel in that we do not, we haven't seen this COVID-19 before, but what it does, it's really a magnifier of what's going on already in a healthcare organization. So I would say that COVID does not make an organization. It it shows an organization's true colors. And so okay. the organization- so I've always said it's like a magnifier of like the problems that we were exactly. facing in COVID. So what did you learn? And so what I learned when I went into this new organization that it really didn't align with my core values, right? The way in which they treated their physicians didn't align with how I wanted to treat physicians, the quality of care. And so I chose to furlough myself. I'm, I'm unique in that sense. But what I will say furloughed is that, your, did you just say you furloughed yourself? Yes, it's a unique way of saying I resigned. <laughs> Why? And it, honestly, it just wasn't an organization that aligned with my core values. I mean, a lot of what you can see in healthcare, they're very different organizations. We do not have a universal healthcare system. So we have for-profit systems, we have not-for-profit, we have faith-based, we have a number of different systems. And then in these different systems, um, your approach to healthcare is different, right? You, you might have different values and different um, things that you are searching for doing in different kind of ethical guidelines. So the organization that I walked into did not meet my own personal core values in terms of delivery of healthcare. So at the time, I it was coming down to a choice in which we were going to have to lay off a number of staff. So I in turn chose to resign because I knew that this was an organization that I could devote my full self in the midst of the coronavirus too. So you told me you're, you're a consultant right now with the life's work of committed to eliminating healthcare disparities. What does right. that mean? So I think we should back up at this point and talk a little bit about the difference between healthcare. Fortunately, we only have a couple minutes, so we gotta be quick. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I know it's a big subject. We'll get to this quick. So in yeah. the difference between healthcare, which is the delivery of um, the organized delivery of medical care and health and is that health really focuses more on the state of complete physical and mental and social well-being and not just the absence of disease, right? And so in America, we focus on, we spend a lot of money on health care. We right. beat every record. We spend more than any other country on health care. Um, but yet our health outcomes are not as great as other developed nations and some underdeveloped nations. And what's really driving this are social determinants of health, right? And the social determinants of health are the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work. Um, and this is something like your socioeconomic status, your education, and your physical environment. And okay. we see disparities in health outcomes based on these social determinants of health. So the work that I do and what I'm passionate about is eliminating healthcare disparities. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah, wow, okay. Well, I hope we see you continue your goals. Again, I've always said that COVID is a magnifier of all the shit that plagued our society and hopefully an accelerator to the world that we wanna have. And there's people like you, Nicole, who really are there to try to make the world a better place and we will always support you. So please put your information in the chat and awesome. uh, thank you so much for your time and good luck. And uh, 
you know, this is a tough time and thank you for, you know, helping us all try to get through this on a health level, mental health level, and in terms of racial and class disparity. So thanks. Awesome. So much. All right. Now we're going to hear from a, a medical physician, uh, Roxana Miran, uh, very highly accomplished, working at uh, Mount Sinai, focuses more on cardiology and the heart. In fact, this segment is called the heart of COVID. We talked about the heart of the household. Nicole Friday has an amazing heart. And now we have Roxana, who is working on the heart, but also has an amazing heart. So Roxana, thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Nicole, you're amazing. I just love listening to you. And we need more women like you as major hospital administrators who really get it and understand the disparities of health and what is really going on in the real world, which there is such a huge disparity that we absolutely must close. And we need more black doctors, more Hispanic doctors, more women doctors, more cardiologists that look like our patients. Uh, and uh, we will make an important uh, difference if we actually get there. So thank you for everything that you do. I was Give Nicole a round of applause. I know you're all on mute, but we, we need, look at a vision. We need more, more, more people like you, really. Yeah, that's amazing. All right, I'll connect you two afterwards. Maybe, uh, Nicole, you'll move to New York and help us yeah, all. Yeah, Nicole is amazing. I all love right, your so energy. you're amazing too. So tell us about you. So what, well, what's your role at Mount Sinai? So I am um, I am the Mount Sinai Professor of uh, Clinical Research in Cardiology, as well as Professor of Medicine, Professor of Population Health Science, and policy as well as professor. I have a lot of professorships. Yeah, wow. Uh, but I'm, I'm only, I'm, I'm really How young. long have you been I in school? I started when I was like crawling. I started a long time ago, but um, it, has been a, it has been a fantastic uh, journey to get here. And I'm here to pull up more women into cardiology as the, uh, the platform I told you about, Women as One, which is a not-for-profit 501c3 uh, organization set up to close the gap, the gender gap that exists in medicine. And we started with the most broken house, which is the house of cardiology. Uh, very few women cardiologists are there. Very few women leaders in cardiology. Very few professors in cardiology. And this all must stop because we're losing really amazing, talented women who are choosing to run away from cardiology because it's not friendly to women. Much like a lot of other subspecialties and uh, boardrooms where they don't welcome women, we want to change that narrative and promote talent. And everyone should go to our website, womenasone.org. Uh, Please go there, you'll love it. There are so many wonderful testimonials as well as many programs. So that's, that's one of my platforms, but I am a okay, well, Jarvis, Jarvis is going to uh, put the website in there so everybody oh, can. Oh, wonderful. I'm a, well, let me ask you a, question. I'm a practicing let me... cardiologist, and I was on the front lines uh, during the COVID pandemic, and there's a lot to talk about. Uh, and so I think much. the most important thing that I hope that your domesticity is teaching everyone in their new homes and in their new lives during this pandemic which will change how we practice and how we are socially, as well as we're, what we're doing at our work and, and especially with our own uh, families, is to uh, remember that there is one way, there's only one way to uh, prevent the virus. And that is by uh, the three W's, washing your hands, wearing a mask, watching your distance, and um, really, really going after that in a very serious fashion. Wearing a mask is not a political statement. Unfortunately, it has turned into that. And it, it just makes me crazy every time I turn on any of the news. Uh, I'm so glad we're on this and not listening to CNN or Fox or whatever, who, which turns this whole thing into a, a fight between Fauci and Trump. And the truth is it's the health Human health is at stake here. I watched many, many people just die before my eyes without us being able to do anything for them during the heart of the pandemic here in New York City, in the epicenter of the epicenters. 
And I think it's really important that we get that message out. And wearing a mask and the type of the mask does matter. And I think you wanna you wanna show. Yeah, a yeah. What, what do you I, mean I by the type little, of the mask? I, I gave so, you. So yeah, a I wanted. Bit of a I asked tutorial you. Tutorial yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah, okay. So this is great. So people here in New York, especially where I live in Chelsea, I see mostly everybody covering their face when they're masked, right? And good. yeah, which is good. But I actually, you know, I'm supposed to be the educator and the zeitgeist, and I showed myself on Instagram wearing a bandana. And a friend of mine basically said, you know, you, you should educate everybody and tell them that they need to wear a real mask. And I'm like, why? You know what? I'm going to ask Dr. Moran about that. So wh why is this, which is very stylish, right? I look really cool, right? Or maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, uh, you know, like this I see a lot of those and, yeah. and, you know, that is better than nothing. I certainly <laughs> wouldn't want, uh, you know, I'm happy that at least they're doing something. When you wear a mask, you are showing to the world and to everyone that you so care about that you're respecting others and that you're not being, you're being selfless and you're respecting others because it's your body fluids that you are keeping within the mask and not to the not aerosolized to the to the people around you and so this is better than none but i ask you and and i ask you to do this yeah how do you know exercise. if there's a good mask you i just... want you to do this exercise so light okay. a candle for me okay let me hold on hold on this one my house, talk about the new domesticity. I need to read this book because it's like all over the place. By the way, before I say that, I just want to say I'm, all, I'm a gay man. And uh, I was just thinking, like, I didn't mean to leave out gay couples, gay GLBTQIA couples in that, in that last domesticity. But that's another point of, of the, the new domesticity. So I, I hope I, you know, I wanted, I forgot to put that thing in. Brain fart. But yes, the new domesticity is about... GLBTQIA. All right, so I got a candle. Mm -hmm. and I got a lighter. So what do you want me to do? I light the candle. Oh, okay. Oh, no. Okay. Now right. blow the candle. <sighs> what does that what mean? What do you think? Well, I, mean, I don't know. Well, I guess it's aerosol that's blowing that out. Well, it's air coming out, right? Okay. Yeah. Let's so wear, I, do you have okay. other masks? Well, should I wear this one instead? Yeah, why don't you try that one? Okay. That's the KN95, it's, it's, right? It's the, the KN95. The one you paid five bucks for. Yeah, I bought a hundred of them. Wow. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I'm hoarding. That's it's nice. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, now I like the same candle. Okay. But these aren't the 90, the, these aren't the ones that you're using. No, no. What we're using is really turbo. Oh, wow. Okay. candle with all your might okay well that is thank <laughs> you for protecting math? me all thank right. you for protecting me all right everybody so, wear one of these what about those blue medical masks well you know i mean i think you know there it's better than none and and uh, there is the question you know and and the big thing that i wanted to show everybody is that when you wear a mask and another person wears a mask you're protecting each other uh, you're, uh, and then if you wear two masks on top of each other, uh, when you have those thin ones, you could, you know, you will protect even further. So it's, a, it's really important, especially if you're going to be in close quarters with people. Now, I, it's really hard to exercise. Yesterday I went, it's really hot out. And yesterday I went for a very long walk. I needed to uh, clear my head, long walk uh, into Central Park. And um, it was really hard to wear that, yeah. the, the, that good mask. And so right. I wore the other mask. And, um, you know, I was really keeping my distance from others. So again, really important to wear a mask, to wash your hands, and to watch your distance amongst the, those three W's. Remember them, follow them. Is that is did that this in New York. You saw that in, in April 3rd, on April 3rd, just on that day, 
over 500 people died in our in our hospitals it was just carnage on a daily basis every shift we were losing 10 15 people in our hospital hospital system so it was really very very difficult to watch and look where we are as of uh, Monday, July 13th, the current hospitalizations in the entire state of New York is at 820. At the Mount Sinai hospitals, 11 hospitals at Mount Sinai, it's at 32. That's pretty wow. good. That's amazing. And the new positives on July 13th, they're just the new positives. Of the 4.7 million persons tested is 912. 912 as of July 13th, positive and zero deaths on July 12th. This is unbelievable. And it is because of the, um, the close down, the, 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 uh, the complete lockdown. Yep. And also the fact that people are following some of these social distancing rules. And of course, yesterday I heard that in, um, in um, Suffolk County, it was going up a little bit after 4th of July because of the beaches, et cetera. So we really need to be extremely careful. Now, um, why? Is the rest of the country like spiking well, to like they said as, as much as we were in March in the beginning? I think one of the things that happened is that um, they closed down around the same time that New York was getting the, the really, really, you know, and New York is a very populated, extremely dense uh, four or five at, or airports in the vicinity of the New York, New Jersey, Connecticut area, international right, flights coming in, many, many. Uh, travelers using taxis, et cetera. And so there was just an explosion of that, of the, of the infection. And of course, the, the close down, I would even say, came a little bit too late in New York, honestly, a couple of weeks too late, but we were able to, to control it. Um, what was happening, the rest of the country, especially the middle of the country, it really hadn't disseminated there. And they closed around the same time, but then got I mean, there has to be this balance, right? Of like, you know, what about the businesses? We're not seeing COVID. What's going, you know, why do we have to do this? And people just couldn't care and made it into a political issue and started, I, I was watching what was going on on, on a Memorial Weekend in the Ozarks. And uh, I was like, oh my God. And I keep telling people, if you don't like wearing a mask, you're not going to like the ventilator very much because if you want to feel suffocated, it's exactly that, where well, you're just, you know, in a, in a machine breathing for you. So the mask part was a huge part when I was watching people on top of each other, no masks. And of course, it just explodes. And, and we're seeing it now. And unfortunately, uh, what's happening in the United States is shameful, frankly, as a, as a world-class leader uh, of the world, we really are not looking at all at, at all leading the way in COVID, unfortunately. So that's, uh, thank you for explaining that. So if I, I mean, New York, I've been telling people it's like Paris, right? I mean, there's like tables in the streets and they're closing the streets. And I mean, I went to a restaurant that was so responsible that I went to the bathroom, they followed me with a mop. And <laughs> I'm sorry to joke about it, but I was impressed. And uh, yeah, I, uh, I mean, so if I'm having dinner with somebody and I guess tables really aren't six feet apart, should I be wearing a mask? And I how do you do you that when you're know about, I mean, one of the things that I do with, um, with anyone that I'm with is that, I mean, I've tested my, I personally have been tested four times already just because of the, the way it is in the hospital, hospital health care is where, where we're very, very responsible here at Mount Sinai and in other uh, uh, hospitals yeah. here in New York. Uh, we're constantly being tested uh, and making sure that our patients are safe. But um, I think one of the things is to really understand who, who it is that you're having uh, uh, dinner with yeah. and, and, yeah. and what, do you, what do you know about that person? Are they quarantine or are they out, out and about? And, be, yeah. and not be bashful and asking them, look, you know, what you don't want to do, you, none of us want this disease. 
because we just don't know anything about this. That's what I was going to ask. How does it impact uh, your cardiologist, right? How is it impacting our organs, our hearts? Like, should we? It like, is an unbelievably uh, difficult um, uh, virus. It is uh, obviously it's a respiratory. It comes into the system through the respiratory, through the droplets, through the what we call the ACE2 receptor, which is. Okay. Uh, a lot in the lining of our uh, our uh, nose, mouth, etc. So it comes in, but the response uh, and it just gets st it sticks. It has these prongs that just sticks into the receptors inside of our endothelial receptors inside of the lungs, especially throughout the lungs. That's why you see this diffuse, like almost nodules all over the lungs because the the lung starts to. The, the, the body starts to respond to the to the to the uh, attack of the virus, and therefore you, the, you and it starts to replicate beautifully. It loves that uh, milieu, yeah. starts to replicate and just uh, go crazy, and then the body responds back with a massive inflammatory response, which has now hit hit not just the virus but your entire organ system, including the heart, the kidney, uh, of course the lungs more clotting the brain and it just is relentless and uh very very difficult and attacks the lungs not just your own body going after the the virus attacking the normal tissue of the lungs as well so a really really fulminant response in certain patients we know some patients have that kind of a, a very very um, a fulminant response with severe illnesses and, and death. And uh, others could be almost asymptomatic, the younger people who could be just the carriers and walk right. around and give it to everybody. Yeah, because and, people are uh, like, and then the middle flu. ground. Yeah, it's just like a flu, people are saying. So like we should no, work it, if we this is not This is not the flu at all. I mean, people should know that it is not the flu. And uh, one of the things that's, that was uh, unbelievable for us to see is, is we were just learning as we were going along. And what was beautiful to see is how the hospital systems got together. We used the electronic health records in pooling the data, evaluating who's working, who's at risk, what's going on, sharing that data with the CT, CDC, sharing the data with the world and all of the healthcare group. I mean, it, I just hope that the world understands what these healthcare workers, researchers, scientists have done to save the human lives that have been at stake and where we would have been without their incredible selflessness. And I think it's a really important one. As the virus dissipates, people will forget, especially forget what these, what these healthcare workers did um, in, the, in, the, in the heat of the moment. And, just Will it dissipate? Jumping in. Will it and, dissipate, you think? Excuse me? Will it dissipate at some point? Or oh, we... I, I think so. It's like anything else. You know, it's what's in fashion. Everyone's talking about healthcare workers when the when things were terrible and then the moment uh, you know, no, no, no. France COVID. just gave you know what France just did? The entire country of France gave nine billion dollars in um in increasing salaries for healthcare workers who were working during the COVID uh, pandemic. You know what's going on now? The hospitals are all suffering because what's happening, patients are not coming into the hospitals and the hospitals are under huge financial um, uh, duress. And what we're hearing is, look, we have to make cuts. Uh, and we're like, what? We, everybody was working around the clock, cuts and everything. I mean, they're doing their very best, but. It's going to be it's going to be difficult. Well, no, no, I was actually talking about COVID. Is that going yeah. to dissipate? Oh, the actual COVID? virus. Yeah. No, the virus. Um, I'm sorry to say, uh, I said it very early in February because I had very close colleagues in uh, in Italy, uh, in northern Italy, and they were showing me, sending me chest X-rays, telling me we've never seen anything like this. What do you think? What? And when I saw that and I started to see that it was coming in, I just said, 2020 is finished. And it is, I mean, we cannot be traveling 2020, just put it out of your mind, it's, a, it's gone. And what is, what you have to hope for is the new normal 
And even if the vaccine is available, you remember that even if you have a vaccine, not everyone is going to develop antibodies. Not, it's not 100% for everybody. We have seen people who receive uh, vaccines for the flu vaccine and then end up getting the flu anyway because, because the virus gets smart, starts to make uh, new strains, etc. So we um, are going to have to have this new normal and continue to work around the clock in understanding how to be ready and how to protect everyone if this doesn't go the way it's supposed to. And this whole idea that, oh, we're all going to be fine by next year when the vaccine comes, we'll be, I think we need to, yes, let's be hopeful. I don't want to be all negative. I want to give a positive vibe. Look what we did in New York. You can do it too in your state. Uh, I think we have to just understand that it's not going to be a slam dunk. So do you feel that we're going to be wearing this for the rest of history? I think we're going to, I think if you see what happened with SARS, yeah. Uh, and uh, we were seeing Asians uh, here in, 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 you know, I travel a lot and I would go on, on in, in Asia and almost everyone, even though there was no pandemic there, most everybody was wearing masks because they understood that such a thing could happen again. And I think they were very much more ready for a pandemic like this because unfortunately they uh, experienced SARS. Uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, we now uh, have to think exactly in that direction, unfortunately. Right. Well, you but probably I do have wanna, to wrap. Do you have I, to wrap up or do you have so some more? I wanted to touch base okay, for good. everybody. Uh, you started such a beautiful piece on domesticity and the fact that, and, and that you watched uh, the, uh, the, the people who are finding, you know, spring cleaning and working and, and one of the things that I think is extremely important to think about, and we are really on top of this, is how much harder it is for women during this pandemic. Uh, and I'm not saying it because, you know, I think about uh, the single moms, I think about moms taking the full responsibility of the children's education and their children's um, well being, their food everything in the house. And even though um, the current generation, the Gen Z or whatever you yeah. want to call them are much better in partnership, uh, I can tell you that the burden, the burden on women is twice, if not three times as much, uh, but their pay is not that much. And they have a lot of work that's unpaid, unrecognized, unseen. Uh, and uh, we absolutely must be, pay attention to that. Uh, at Women as One, we are very, very much focused on the fact that women physicians who are asked now to go back, think about women and the frontline workers for the most part were women because nurses are mostly women. The technicians are mostly women, honestly, believe it or not. Uh, and they were on top, they were there working as well as having to leave their families because that was their job to show up and be the frontline workers, plus the doctors uh, who are the junior doctors that are mostly women actually, believe it or not. Okay. And so uh, what, what we saw is this unbelievable burden on mothers leaving their children and family for weeks because they didn't want to expose them uh, with, you know, leaving them with caretakers or families or what have you, but still having to deal with everything on top of, um, you know, uh, dealing with the horrific, horrific mental care, uh, you know, what, what, what it did in, to all of us, our, our mental health and our well-being, physician's well-being, which no one talks about. If I'm not well in my head and in my mind and in my body, I can't do the best possible job for my patients. And so this whole uh, idea of paying more attention to healthcare workers and their well-being is something that is unseen and unspoken. Uh, and we are the invisible army that takes care of everything in the house as well as everything else that's going on in, um, in, um, in our uh, daily work. And um, I, I'm just glad that you paid attention to that. And I'm really, really excited about uh, working closer with you. I think I need to come back because we have so much to talk about. I know, we I know. We didn't get to talk about heart disease. Well, that can and we, the fact that people are not about? coming in with their heart attacks. And they were sitting on their heart attacks because they were afraid to go to the hospital 
because they thought they would get COVID. And we, all these, so many deaths um, happened because people didn't come to present with their heart attacks in a timely level and a timely basis. So we got to talk about that another time. We got to talk so. about that. One more thing I would love for you to talk about as a cardiologist, right? By the way, a lot of uh, the people that you said were women, there are a lot of black and brown nurses. Of course, of right? course. So you have that situation too. 100%, 100%. And then the last thing I'm sure, female heart disease. Big yes. problem. Heart right? disease in women, number one cause of death uh, for women in the United States and around the globe. Uh, I am leading a commission for the Lancet Journal on um, uh, the, the, it was, it's the 2020 vision for 2030. And we're going to give the commissioners work together to give uh, all of our top 10 list of what you must do to reduce the burden and the morbidity, mortality of heart disease in women. And a lot of it is things you can't even imagine. Some of the intangibles of like dealing with domestic violence and the stress on women that has an important impact on their heart well-being. And so, and the fact that they don't, they present much later with their heart attacks. The fact that they don't know about the fact that they have, their, their number one cause of death for them is actually heart disease compared to seven causes of cancer, including breast and colon and ovarian put together and lung put together heart disease beats it. So and, we and for have women, to heard, absolutely pay attention to this. And I heard women, they have different symptoms, different right? Different symptoms. Like men have like this and women, yep. Yes, and all the women on this call, I hope will make sure that they know their numbers. The American Heart Association works extremely hard on this. We at Mount Sinai lead, uh, lead uh, this work as well as, and, and honestly, make sure you know your number, your cholesterol, your blood pressure, your blood sugar, your hemoglobin A1C, your C-reactive protein, all of these important, important biomarkers that absolutely tell you what is going on in your body. And having those screening and understanding the good mental health, diet and exercise, and stress-free environment, time for yourselves, ladies, time for yourselves. I'm looking to do all of that, by the way. Roxana, <laughs> you're, please, Roxana, share. You're, you're, it's so amazing. I'm so grateful that our friend, uh, who was actually one of our Zeit guests, right? Yes, Miriam yes. Bonacarum introduced yes. us. I'm like so grateful. The last thing I want to just say, thank you for coming. I know we, I mean, we could be on for hours. People are going to be curious. But uh, I like to end with some takeaways. And again, with the medicine and the new domesticity, these are the things I would love everybody to think about as you leave this. Obviously, everything that Nicole and Roxana about our health and our sanity needs to be taken, we need to take care of ourselves. But in terms of the takeaways and the new domesticity, what I've learned or thought about is that everyone you market to, right, in every product, because we have a lot of marketers here, uh, everything has to have a home element. Like, you know, your car, makeup, like CVS showed uh, uh, how to, you know, really put your makeup on in a time of quarantine. The Bud commercial that I showed a few weeks ago where you had the horse and the dog run, you know, so excited and they went to a bar and it said, we're open. It's probably not a good commercial moving forward. Gen Z's will be the more mature and progressive than any generation. The opposite is the mental health, which is going to be the next pandemic, I believe that's going to be talked about uh, because people are gonna be in this new domesticity. Empathy towards teachers, empathy towards health workers. If you are wealthy and you're decided to homeschool, like my friends in Los Angeles, I would suggest maybe include at least one less fortunate student in your group. So if you have 10 students, why don't you bring on somebody that you think would have, you know, won't have the opportunity because of the family situation that they're coming from. And if you're trying to figure out where to donate, right, again, and these kids have to stay at home in, in Los Angeles and San Diego, you know, put money into homeschooling for the less fortunate. And here are my social handles. Next week, we're going to, uh, you know, I told you, Zyka.com, thank you if you want to contribute. And uh, 
the, here are all the ones uh, the, who are booked on our Zeitgeist for the rest of the summer semester, which is ending August 12th. So blessed that you keep coming. Next week, we're going to talk about phil philanthropy and toxic masculinity. Dan Doty has been covered on the Today Show about creating a program called The Everyman, which is teaching men about like why uh, they were part or the bad part of the hashtag me too. A lot of them have been feeling guilty, not really understanding what it means to be a white privileged man. Uh, so he's going to talk about that program. We're going to have the Tony Award winning producer, Ron Simons, who did Ain't Too Proud. Ain't New Pr Oh my God, I, I, whatever. <laughs> Ain't Too Proud, is that what it's called, Jarvis? Uh, thank you. The Color Purple and David Nevins, who's now the chief creative officer of CBS and the, and the chairman of so Showtime. Then I know we had Jana Rich talking about how to get her future job. She's a executive re recruitment uh, advisor. And uh, we're going to have my friend, Matt Seiler, who's going to come in. And they are trying to disrupt what the corporate uh, executive placement's all about, about not defining yourself as like the job you have, but defining yourself by who you are, like what makes you your skill set, so to speak. You know, I'm a curious person, so I should be called curiosity person, right? And that's what I should be hired for. Like, what are your best traits and how do you leverage that today for your next job when a lot of us are unemployed and furloughed? And then we're gonna end with uh, a woman named Tiffany Jana, and she wrote a book called Overcoming Bias and uh, a very special performance by a friend of mine named Princess Lockeru. Her name is Samara. She is one of the leading, or she is the leading whacking expert in the world. For those of you who are watching Legendary on uh, HBO Max about uh, the competitions of the balls uh, in the LGBTQI community. It started in the 80s. Uh, Ryan Murphy made a show about it called Pose, but this is, and which is all about voguing. This is before then in the 70s in terms of Soul Train. So uh, that's the rest of the summer semester. I hope we can all keep doing this. I love it. Um, for those of you who don't know, I also have a premium class, which is all me guiding, And then I do these customized for corporations. So anybody want to reach out, brad at zeitguide.com. I'll see you next week. It's going to be awesome. And uh, I love you all. And thank you, Nicole. And thank you, Roxana. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank Bye. you. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye. Of course.